Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, this is week two in the training sessions of, of Open Security Summit. Um, we are joined by Mario today to talk about DevSecOps or not to DevSecOps. Is that a question? So I have listened to this talk before and it was really an eye-opener for me. So I hope you experience the same as uh, mine. Um, so before we go on, I, I do see a lot of new names. Really glad you guys join us today. Um, and I want to uh, give a quick welcome to all of you and talk about a bit what a Pink Security Summit is. So, um, yeah. So this is one of the training sessions. The actual summit will begin next week. Uh, we normally have these sessions uh, on site uh, in a room or together, but uh, COVID-19 has enabled us to uh, open this up virtually to everyone uh, across the globe, which has been a good opportunity for us. And that way we have been able to have training sessions as well. So, these two weeks, which is we're in the second week now, um, we had a really good first week, uh, good, good feedback from the participants. These are more practitioner-led uh, sessions. The actual summit next week, it will be more collaborative. So there will be organizers, but there will be more discussions from the audience as well. This doesn't mean this session is just gonna be you sitting and listening. We do encourage your uh, interaction with the speaker and challenge him because nobody knows everything about anything. And even if you are new to the industry, your opinion matters as well. Uh, so we do expect your participation. We do expect respect to our speaker and to the others. We do respect you, uh, do challenge, be open, unmute yourself when you have a question, or if you're shy, you can post your question in the chat window. I will be monitoring it. And I will be voicing if Mario uh, doesn't see them in time. Um, everything in the summit is recorded. This video will be recorded. The outcomes from the chat sessions even are uh, posted back on our website, opensecretsummit.org. Um, yeah, everything is open. We're glad you're here. And let's, let's start. I will post our um, hashtag and also our Slack invite in the chat window in a minute. Please do use them. We're here for you. This is a community of teaching each other. We're not all from security. We learn from each other. We do like people from other professions because their diverse opinions progress us better. Anyway, I think I told enough. Mario, over to you. Thank you. So let me share my screen. Just a moment. Paula, tens que te calar mesmo. This is not the presentation, this is just. Yeah. Beijo, beijo, screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Can you hear me well? Yes. As well? Yep. Yeah. Good. Right. So before going into in, into into the talk, just um, a very brief introduction. As with uh, with most of us, um, I think we will all be um, at home at the moment. Um, I've got two kids, so it's probable that uh, you're going to be hearing some background noise. But that's just the nature of being at home and trying to do these things. Um, so the title of this talk is um, "To DevSecOps or Not to DevSecOps?" Is that a question? Um, and this is about um, an archetype-based model that, um, uh, that I've been developing for the past uh, six to nine months um, and uh, that I'm going to be talking to, uh, to you about. Um, so in today's agenda, what we will be covering is um, the two schools of thought with regards to um, the, uh, DevSecOps uh, being a thing or not a thing. Um, who is it for? Um, the DevSecOps security archetype model. So I'm going to talk to you about the, the three different archetypes that are part of the model. Um, we're going to introduce them um, and what makes them them, um, how they uh, grapple with constraints and bottlenecks, um, how we can help them in terms of uh, governance and in terms of the maturity of their practices, 
uh, how we can help them in terms of how they approach the organization of security. Um, so how uh, we can um, uh, change security responsibilities in the organization to take advantage of these things. Uh, and finally, we're going to finish with um, my opinion uh, of if you should be um, doing DevSecOps or not. So I noticed one of the people that I reference in this slide is in the audience. So it's a good, it's probably a good thing that I don't get it wrong. Um, but um, so I think generally speaking, there are two schools of thought with regards to DevSecOps uh, and within or according to the InfoSec industry. So these are all people that I highly respect and look up to as well. Uh, and I believe there are underlying themes to both sides of the arguments. So those advocating for DevSecOps, they usually have arguments that uh, relate to the collaboration between different teams. And there's a point in time need whilst the engineering teams are building up security into their own practices. Uh, those that are less impressed by the use of DevSecOps, they seem to focus their arguments on the possibility for siloing uh, of activities, excessive use of marketing buzzwords, uh, and also fear in relation to current role identities. And uh, they focus on the fact that security needs to be in the hands of engineering because that's where it's needed and not in some governance function that is completely detached from the development and where ownership is not, not going to be effective. Okay? So this relating to the principle that the doers must own and have agency over the scope and the outcomes. There is also a third, uh, less common view that DevSecOps is compliance too, and uh, I couldn't agree less with that. So 10 years ago, um, we didn't call security engineering compliance, and I don't think we should be starting now. Um, it's good that you're doing it. It's good if you're doing it, as it expectedly can make your compliance easier, uh, but they're not the same thing. And uh, with poor communication uh, that um, many times exists in teams, they can actually be completely detached from each other. So it can only become or help compliance once we have effective traceability between what are the policy requirements and the technical controls that we're introducing. And when communication between the different stakeholders allow for one part of the process to inform the other part of the process during both design and also operations. But this is the opinion of security professionals, right? We may be the ones with bigger interest in DevSecOps, um, but we're not its only customers, I don't think. So who are we um, uh, to, or who can we serve with, um, with the word DevSecOps? And I think it can be uh, beneficial to both control and governance functions. So InfoSec is typically one of them, uh, but there are others like finance, service management, program office, especially in organizations that are, are still um, doing the, um, the DevOps transformation, let's call it, um, but also to the engineering organization. But it will serve different and sometimes even opposing objectives. Um, so the model that I'm, I'm going to be introducing next is meant to provide some basis for some meaningful conversations between these different stakeholders. So meet the DevOps uh, security archetype model. Um, so this was built uh, based on uh, exploration with peers and experience in consulting to organizations of all sizes, uh, from startups to government and healthcare institutions, and appreciating the differences between them. Um, when developing a tailored strategy for their needs as a business, but also from understanding what the security unicorns do different and how they approach the, the same challenges. So in this uh, archetype model, uh, we have three basic archetypes. We have Dave, uh, the rainbow maker or magic maker, uh, which is a reference to a cartoon that existed for over a decade now, uh, where we have in a boxing ring all the shiny security controls uh, on one side, and on the other side, we have Dave who clicks all the, all the links and all the things and finds creative ways of avoiding security. So Dave is measured and rewarded on delivering features in stable platforms. So he's going to have an overall focus on speed, but also stability right? and ensuring that he can support the business in making money um, and be successful whilst um, removing any impediments to, to that speed, though not necessarily in a reckless way. Rick uh, is a reference to how most other people outside of compliance tend to perceive control functions, uh, particularly InfoSec, which still has a big reputation for being the department of no. So um, everyone else usually refers to, uh, to Rick by changing the first letter of his name, and, and I'm sure you can guess what that is. Um, and also for the creation of policies and procedures uh, that he expects are adhered to at all times in order to keep the organization compliant to a standard 
or at least be in a position to evidence due diligence, um, the, the due diligence has been performed and also help manage cyber risk. Though these are often uncontextualized and there's no real understanding of the realities of business operations and the impacts that these rules can have. So RIC is measured and rewarded for identifying and managing non-compliances, passing audits successfully, and generally for helping avoid bad outcomes. So there's an overall focus on quality of the things being produced. It is a biased and narrow view of what quality is, uh, but still that's usually where, uh, where the argument comes from. Um, and finally, we have Stu, uh, the security unicorn, uh, which is a reference to those in individuals who have good embedded security practices in their engineering process. And they have both ownership and the agency over the security in the products and services that they're accountable for. So security here is generally perceived as another element of their quality assurance, as performance, cost, and other metrics are. Um, and the security is never something that someone else does. They figured out how to ensure that quality and speed are not mutually exclusive, but indeed mutually supportive. And this is what sets them apart. So this model is uh, applicable not just to individuals, uh, but also to the way the organizations operate in the same fashion. So we often find ourselves in a company which operates in a very gatekeeping fashion, but where multiple stakeholders are mostly rainbow makers. And particularly in startups, and when they fail to account for cultural fit of security people, we have whole organizations and processes made of rainbow makers and a few gatekeeping stakeholders likely to have some permanent frustrations with, their lack, with the lack of their preferred form of governance. So the security unicorn organizations are those who figure out how to do security at scale, such as the Netflixes, the Facebooks, Adina Health, GitHub, and many others that a lot of us praise. So this model is meant to help us think about their needs and expectations of each of the different archetypes and hopefully create targeted plans um, to help them improve their outcomes and decrease their frustrations uh, because that's going to make everyone happier and more effective at their work. So one thing to note about the model is that many will default to seeing all gatekeepers as governance focused individuals and all engineers or designers as rainbow makers, which isn't necessarily the case. In practice, you'll find governance people who have characteristics and largely align with the rainbow maker archetype and vice versa. Okay. Also to note that the characteristics and constraints that I'm gonna be calling out uh, next, uh, they are defined as the extremes or the edges of, of the diagrams, right? And usually reality will be a bit more nuanced than that. So that was kind of the, the, the overall disclaimer. Um, so, a big part of how rainbow makers are perceived by gatekeepers is in claims that they're either negligent, stupid, or they just plain don't care about security. Right? It fails to realize that no developer creates insecure code deliberately, and we should assume that people mean well and produce the best quality artifacts with the current knowledge they possess, within the visibility that they have, and overall constraints. So time is just one of them, but so is culture. Right? Um, so in whether, for instance, product owners are prioritizing security work or not, um, which are imposed by the demands of their practice in their organizational context. Right? The main challenge relates to lack of situational awareness with regards to the security of the things that they are producing. And this is mainly a process and a social practice issue in failing to account for cognitive load of their already difficult practice. So we've got um, uh, development teams that sometimes um, manage code bases with two or three different uh, coding languages, for instance, and we need to account for, for cognitive load uh, when we want to introduce security activities too. Um, and it's those that are failing them. Some of the uh, essential characteristics uh, of this archetype is that they will um, usually lack integrated security telemetry, so they don't have any tooling that can help them identify vulnerabilities that they should be addressing. They will generally avoid engagement with compliance or infosec teams as they tend to misunderstand the context or even the scope of what their job is. And they'd even go so far as to suggest compliance doesn't understand what it takes to get their job done. Um, and, and, the experience is one of, and their experience with compliance is one of mandating things as opposed to any real collaboration. They typically only see compliance when preparing for audits or on the annual awareness courses. Um, there are no agreed and secure baselines in place or modeling of threats of the systems that are being built. 
So there isn't a shared mental model by the team on what can go wrong with the system and what measures they can put in place to prevent uh, those bad outcomes. Um, the next one is not a security thing per se, but there's usually limited automated, automated testing overall. So the practices that could be leveraged to integrate security into operational processes are usually missing too. Uh, there's no product level security reporting, so security is seen as an organizational thing, which leads it to being abstract and reactive and uncontextualized, as opposed to being a product thing where teams understand and manage their backlogs according to the relative prioritization amongst all of the other functional and bug and improvement work that they've already identified. And finally, uh, security is also generally perceived as someone else's job and not something that the teams need to manage. So there's the expectation that at best, someone needs to give them requirements and they need to work towards delivering them, or worst yet, security is being generally absent throughout the life cycle, and it's seen as the things you need to fix as part of the output of the pen test or of the audit. So, one of the big complaints I hear from rainbow makers uh, is that the gatekeepers are either thick, uh, business averse, or just plain difficult to deal with. Coming up with all of these esoteric scenarios of what can go wrong or how the world is going to end in the next three months, or how we're always going to be on the news because of a breach, uh, which may or may not happen. So what more likely is happening is that the gatekeepers uh, lack understanding of how controlled reliance, particularly the form and the appropriateness of how to build security controls, um, in a DevOps environment actually works and how that affects the software development lifecycle and also what automation can mean for that practice. Uh, but it's also about inertia to change uh, due to having had success with how we did security in a non-prem, non-continuous integration environment. So most of the principles are still applicable, but they have different forms. They can mean different shapes and, and flavors, which doesn't fit their current model of what good security looks like. So here we have an issue of team topology and an understanding of their evolution and also poor traceability between what engineers do and what the compliance objectives are. And that's what's failing them. So some of the uh, essential characteristics uh, of the gatekeepers is that they usually have or expect gated processes in meetings with review boards to express their happiness or have the opportunity to effectively block something. So most organizations claiming agility and DevOps still try to embed all of these committees and gates in some fashion. Um, they'll all have very limited understanding of modern development practice uh, because there's also a lot of bad guidance out there. And they need to trust their engineering teams uh, with claims of them being cowboys happening often, or nor do they have any trust in automation and the benefits that they could accrue from having um, uh, from these short feedback loops. Uh, i.e. no matter what you do, what evidence you can provide, they would still prefer to have a pen test and manually check your app for every release if they could get away with it. So they will usually develop policies which are verbatim copies of security standards, like ISO 2701 or even worse, ISO 2702, uh, which goes into a, a lot of outdated detail, I would argue, um, without any understanding of, or consideration for the context that they live in. And these are usually written in ways that rainbow makers can't make sense of or understand what it means to them in their context. And that removes or contributes to them not having any sense of agency or ownership. Right? No one's going to be happy about owning something that uh, they don't even know what it is or what it means to them. Um, as we also recently had a paradigm shift in co-evolution of practices in software development, they will usually lack the technical knowledge to fully understand the patterns in use and they are going to think of cloud systems and orchestration with a mental model of on-prem. Right? And the, this leads to outdated threat models and it's going to lead to uh, potentially pushing for the wrong types of controls to be, uh, to be introduced. So they haven't understood how distributed systems can lead to availability, how immutability relates to integrity, or how designing for ephemerality can support your confidentiality objectives. So Stu and this team of security unicorns are okay. Uh, they have a great engineering culture and they are a learning organization. And by learning organization, I mean it in the sense that Andrew Clay Schaffer refers to it, which is that uh, learning organizations become graduate studies in the skills they require to be successful. 
Right? So it's not about rainbow makers or gatekeepers being good generic experts in their own functional silos, but on learning and having the requisite knowledge and know the materials and know-how to make your company successful in its current socio-technical context. Right? It's about the, the people, the interactions between people, about the technology that they use, the processes they use, all of that coming together, uh, which make up the socio-technical context. Uh, and there's true collaboration to establish good practices, and then there's trust that the teams are rooting for the same objectives and that they have everything they need to do a good job. Some of the essential characteristics uh, for the unicorns. Um, so for the unicorns, security is embedded into their practices, and it's not seen as something separate from product or service quality. Operating models such as SRE help make this clearer to teams, but it's not a necessity. So teams understand the threat models of their applications in failure modes, and they do work to mitigate the occurrence of incidents and mitigate any potential impact. Their process considers security end-to-end, -end, uh, and it considers how suitable it is for the product being developed. Right? So they think what feedback should be provided at the IDE level, how much security and which tests should run after every commit, as opposed to in a QA environment alongside full integration tests where there's more time for further validations. And they also think about what conditions need to be met before we expect a build to fail on a security issue. And they think about how they can put on the hands of developers the tools and the processes they need to manage false positives from their own code repositories. Uh, compliance is code in that gatekeepers, they don't tell or send a spreadsheet that rainbow makers need to fill in, but the security requirements are expressed as code and tests that software needs to pass, right? as with other elements of quality. There's also less of a command and control ivory tower in hiding behind the, the keyboard type approach from compliance teams and more true collaboration and even guided adaptability where constant iterations build up the overall security posture over time. So they're not constantly fighting an audit gap, they're iterating to make their products more secure. Right, but uh, in their current practices, they, all of these archetypes, they're affected by, by bottlenecks. And that's what we are going to look at next. So I'd argue that the number of challenge um, for rainbow makers is the lack of security telemetry in the form of a baseline. So in many organizations, this covers some of what we would consider basics, such as dependency scanning, set code analysis, secret scanning, um, and basic configuration hardening. Uh, another bottleneck is usually in the form of product visibility of security work. So um, I see this a lot when I do my consulting work. I go and talk with devs and engineers, and they all know dozens of security issues they'd like to address, but they're not on the backlog. Nor is there any periodic review or clear alignment to business goals or attributes. Nor can we use metadata to filter only for the security work. Um, security expertise is also often missing. Um, either because it's not even identified as a need, or in places where it is, an overly optimistic and unrealistic expectation that all engineers and, and devs need to be security experts. And that fails to account for issues of cognitive load, incentives and business priorities, and generates pushback on taking responsibility. And uh, usually the bland vanilla approaches to security awareness make this even worse, not better. Um, there's also poor process assurance and practices. So in that the teams don't regularly perform the types of practices that increase the likelihood of creating secure software, like threat modeling, for instance, and the creation of tests to validate continuous working of the security controls. Um, there's also a low sense of agency and ownership for security, which is coupled with low expertise and lack of telemetry. But, uh, but it's a problem in and of itself, which is created both by organizational design and the separation of duties relating to security. Um, so for the, for the gatekeepers, uh, one of the main challenges is around team topologies and the assignment of security responsibilities. Most of these are unbalanced with the needs of agency and autonomy of modern development practices. So um, something that uh, we talk a lot about in security is the 1 to 100 ratio, right? And I think this also stems uh, from that. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we see the non-working extremes more often than not. If the gatekeepers take too much onto themselves 
so they don't stick to setting control objectives only and the own all policies, procedures and governance and thus become bottlenecks in the process and the guidance becomes uncontextualized and often wrong for development or on the other extreme they just delegate the whole lot and assume that the security know-how and practices exist where they don't and provide no support to actually building that know-how. I still see more security budget being spent outside of the realm of the development process than for initiatives that would help with developer experience of security and the engineering experience of security. And that's where we should, in my opinion, we should be focusing most of our, our security budgets. Um, so, because if it's not helping uh, our, um, I'm going to call it digital front lines, anything that you do will be either will be more ineffective and will cost more to fix later. So these gated processes and out of band approvals are also typical uh, expectations. And the usual expectation of forms and spreadsheets to be, be filled out by the devs and engineering teams doesn't support process integration or collaboration. There are also control reliance mismatches in that particular forms um, of controls are expected but may not be present. Right? And it also relates to issues of trust. Right, so they expect a commercial product when native capabilities achieve similar benefit or by configuring our products uh, properly and securely, we could have those same benefits without introducing an, an additional commercial product. Security policies aren't written as code or at least expressed as user stories and in that way enabling better communication between parties. Uh, there's also a, a command and control ivory tower type approach um, of sending emails, expecting that streams drop what, drop what they're doing because security is important. And they see themselves more as requirement setters than they are collaboration partners. And finally, inertia also exists due to the success of their past model. But having been good at security on-prem environments doesn't necessarily make you qualified to secure an architecture of microservices and orchestration. Yes, some of the basic principles still apply, but forms will vary widely. And many haven't kept their skills current or rely on their teams to educate them. There's a lot of product-driven bolt-on security of the past, which is a significant impediment to integrating security practices by DevOps and engineering teams. Because as opposed to having to expect that um, your DevOps teams and your devs become proficient in security with the tools that they have, we are expecting them to learn about all of these products from different companies, and that's a significant impediment to, to integrating practices. So those are the, the, the bottlenecks and constraints of each of the, uh, the different archetypes. Uh, but there are some other further challenges that we'll discuss next as well. So one of them is communication between these stakeholders, uh, traceability and process uh, that can support them, uh, the learning journal uh, journey and mental models that they currently have and how they need to evolve, and evolution of practices within uh, the organizations, and finally, the, the team topologies and the organization of, uh, uh, of security responsibilities in the organization. So in order to enable uh, better communication, uh, we need to consider or at least understand the mental models of the different stakeholders, which often align to the structure of their management systems and how we can use those more effectively to communicate. The time spent in types of stories that the different archetypes use and tell each other is also an issue and the language that they're using to communicate their concerns is also um, often problematic. And that's what we'll look at each of these uh, next. So this slide is in reference to John Allspaw's material in resilience engineering, uh, in that different stakeholders may talk about what their systems are through the lens of their mental models, the things they build their systems with, in the actual products and services provided. And the, the problem is that they'll use the same names, but their understanding of the system will be very different. This isn't a bad thing though. This heterogeneity and diversity makes organizations more resilient and this should be encouraged, but it can introduce challenges in communication because people have different expectations or different understandings of what the things are. Also, the time span of the narratives are different. So gatekeepers talk a lot about risk. So there's uncertainty, possibility, um, in yearly or multi-year cycles of transformation and change. While rainbow makers, they prefer or like to understand what they can do here and now over the coming sprint, over the next few months at best. And connecting these two types of narratives is not trivial, but it's part of the work that needs to happen if we're going to enable better communication and cooperation. 
And this is where I think adoption and connection of practices of risk management and threat modeling can help make this connection. Uh, and it's, but it's also something that is not, um, generally speaking, very well done in organizations. So the language these stakeholders use is also largely different and not conducive to direct collaboration. So something often, that often requires boundary spanners, um, so individuals or roles that help to break this communication gap as they have good understanding of both domains. So missing those, and even with those, we should aim to make this language more traceable if we cannot make it shared, right? which should be the goal. If we can uh, get shared language, shared terms that we, uh, that we all agree and we also know mean the same thing to each parties, then that's uh, the, the ideal scenario. If we can't do that, because often we can't, then the next best thing is to have it traceable, right? So that one stakeholder says one thing, this is what it means to the other. Um, and there are two syndromes that usually happen as a result of this communication mismatch. So this is what I call the new regulation syndrome, and I've seen it happen with GDPR and the NDR, so uh, medical device regulation, in that the gatekeepers like to say, uh, as with any consultant, it depends, but rainbow makers actually need a specification, right? You need to tell them something that they can build a spec around. So this is one of the problems. This is not helpful. And also what I like to call uncontextualized policy syndrome, uh, where gatekeepers write pretty words on paper uh, that have no chance of being made operational without significant operational impact, or even completely miss what it takes to get the job done from the point of view of the rainbow makers. Um, so these policies typically live in Word documents or spreadsheets that rainbow makers hear about on the annual awareness training, but couldn't actually find them even if their lives depended on it, or even understand what it means to their daily practices and how they develop and release code. So for this, uh, we should think about governance models happening at different timescales. But exposing security concerns in specialist appropriate language that can work for both parties. But, um, we, we should not be aiming to, to have all of parts of the organization working at different time spans, working off the same standards, because that, that's usually not a, a good way to, to introduce collaboration. So if the gatekeepers are very used to ticking boxes, having overall governance frameworks that enable um, clearer uh, auditing, then let's use them. So something like the Department of Defense Enterprise DevSecOps reference design can work well um, for these types of stakeholders. Just don't try and shove it down the rainbow maker's throats, right? Because that's not how they see their practice, right? Uh, they, they're, not, they're probably not gonna have much agency if we're uh, getting them with these big spreadsheets with dull big things on what can be done in the next five years, right? So something like the DevSecOps maturity model, uh, which is iterative in nature, may help uh, the rainbow makers uh, give them what they need so they can focus on what's the next thing that they can do uh, and they can actually create specs and iterate around them and also be happy about owning because they can they, they can see the, the different stages and they can start um, having some agency and ownership of uh, what it is that they should be focusing on next. And then what we need to do is map and trace it. So, so that we know that in, which area is and what next steps they can give forward that are mutually beneficial, right? But uh, this idea of us having to have a single um, governance framework uh, working across multiple time spans, that's the type of thing we need to start moving away from, in my opinion. Um, so another example is through uh, mapping, uh, something like a checklist formatted standard, such as the application security verification standard, uh, which can help and can be mapped to OWASP 20 proactive controls or OWASP cheat sheets so that the rainbow makers can have uh, clarity on what the gatekeepers actually mean and what they need to do about it with a clear specification, code snippets that they can leverage, and they can uh, look at the examples and uh, introduce those into, into their practices. And we also need to get better at using metadata to connect all of these things together. So gatekeepers and repo makers keep looking at different parts of the process for their assurances, right? 
uh, both from a governance and from an engineering perspective. So what tests are we running? What standards are we meeting? What hardening do we have in place? All, all those types of um, uh, things. What compliance requirements are we meeting? When in 2020, there's really no reason why we shouldn't be in the position to just query our production clusters uh, and get an accurate, accurate picture of all the security validations which happened through the process. Right? We just do need to think about this in advance and think about how we're going to leverage the use of metadata so that we can start looking at our production clusters and use that as the artifacts the, to have meaningful conversations between both compliance teams and engineering teams. Right? Uh, as opposed to um, let me look at your design document, let's see what we've done there, let me look at your Jira tickets, let's see what we've done there. There's really no good reason why we shouldn't be thinking more end-to-end -end in terms of how we can leverage metadata to, uh, to make these conversations easier. So the question is, how can we effectively connect these practices uh, between risk management and, uh, and threat modeling? So for those that know about um, uh, uh, SAPSA security architecture, um, you will see that um, this um, uses some concepts uh, of it, uh, particularly the risk modeling approaches to business attributes, uh, but it's not a necessity. This is my preferred way of, of doing it, uh, but you can connect this to, to typical risk management processes as well. But the idea is that we have a differentiation between what is strategic risk, right? what is that the organization is trying to, to achieve, in terms of uh, VP and director levels, uh, that we start thinking about um, key risk indicators uh, that can be agreed at the product, uh, but also at the organizational level. Uh, this will obviously require uh, collaboration with product owners, uh, which can then help inform the scope and focus of threat modeling sessions in what it means to the threats that we're looking out for, the mitigations we're putting in place, and uh, how we're gonna have uh, the continuous validation preferably automated, uh, that our controls are still in place. Right? And this is what will allow the security program to scale, doing it once and having the continuous validation that the controls are present and working as expected. And that we're going to have, that we have the telemetry in place that can let everyone know when the mitigations are missing or security tests um, which are important have failed. Right? And as with SLOs, this should be highly contextualized to the product it relates to and not some generic organizational thing. We really need this at the, at the team level, at the product level, at the team level, so that the teams can start having real world conversations to what it means to them on uh, applying some, uh, some of these practices and, and how they're gonna manage their backlogs. But we also need a process to connect these. More often, um, particularly when we've got this uh, gap of communication between gatekeepers and rainbow makers, uh, we have a risk analysis that immediately defines mitigation plans, which may or may not be considerate of operational constraints and trade-offs. So part of having teams own and have agency over the security of what they build uh, means that we need to give them the opportunity to contribute and align this with the development life cycle, uh, which means we need to have stories attached to them that are prior, part of product roadmaps and not just left field asks by gatekeepers which often that's the form that security gets. So a cycle of performing a risk analysis to inform engineering, which then triggers targeted threat modeling, and we can, which we then develop the mitigations that we're going to put in place that can be traced back to the risk treatment plan um, is the way to go, and the way to connect these things to address the outcome of the risk analysis. Right? Uh, in, uh, again, we need to think about how the process is going to help us to, to do this iteratively and, and do this in a way that is traceable and provides visibility not just to the engineering process but also to the compliance and governance process. But this won't necessarily come natural um, as the, the key constraints is usually both um, in the teams and the process or automation. So we need to understand that some of those constraints are uh, and how we can iteratively address them by meeting our stakeholders where they are. And this is where, where it's key, right? Is understanding what is the world view of, uh, of our stakeholders, whether uh, they're more rainbow makers or they're more gatekeepers, um, in understand wh where they are and help them with the next step that they, uh, that they should be doing in order to, uh, to elevate their, their knowledge and their understanding of, um, of how to integrate security into the um, development practice. Um, 
so just a, a side note this relates to um, something that Jay Bloom calls uh, futures. Uh, you should follow him on Twitter. That's his Twitter handle. Um, in the three frames of DevOps talk, uh, I will also advise everyone to, to go and see it. Uh, that um, was the basis of um, how I built some of these ideas as well. So left to their own device, a true gatekeeper will expect or prefer an independent code review and pen test after every change. Right? Because that's what their model of the world tells them what the good security is. But that we know would make security the bottleneck of the delivery process. But they can probably comprehend and agree on benefits of policy as code and threat modeling if we show them how it can be connected and helpful. Right? So uh, the, that's the difference between the preferable and what's plausible right? in their own uh, current mental model. Um, policy as code, starting with simple stuff, um, with a, such as checking cookies or the simpler parts of ASVS. So in the early 2000s, I was a penetration tester myself. I've seen literally hundreds of pen tests in my, in my life um, so far. And I'm probably yet to find two or three of them that don't have insecure cookies as a, as a pen test finding. Right? And it's really, really easy to, to implement a check as compliance as code as policy as code, and that's how we can start bringing um, some of the gatekeepers to the idea that we can actually automate a lot of these checks and not have to wait nine, six or nine months for the pen test to, the, to be done on a major release, but actually create these policy as code tests so that the developers get immediate feedback that it's not meeting policy and give them an opportunity to do something about it before we need to, to go fix it in anger 48 hours before, um, before go live as um, I'm sure you've all found yourselves in similar situations too. So once we start building that trust, we can then think about expanding those and start integrating some of those outputs directly into the governance process so that the gatekeepers can start benefiting from these shorter feedback loops in a way that they comprehend. So directly connected to their management, um, to their GRC tool or GRC way of doing things. And finally, we can then maybe think of more advanced things, which currently may sit outside his or her view of what's possible. So I've specifically added blameless postmortems here as a true gatekeeper will likely have written the disciplinary process and this command and control view of the world may say those words, those words but not really mean it. Right? Or suggesting to a gatekeeper will purposely be breaking things in production is not going to bode well. Right? We're going to have to build up to that and eventually be at a place where all of these practices are part of what the gatekeepers is as preferable because they understand the benefits they provide to the whole system and how it enables the creation of more, of more resilient systems and more resilient organizations too. Uh, and the similar thing should happen with Brembo makers. So they may currently lack the security expertise. So starting by introducing stride and threat modeling, uh, in getting them ready, um, getting them to review and identify threats on their current processes and practices is a great way to get started, as that's where their agency will currently sit. Right? So bear in mind that most uh, rainbow, maker, um, uh, rainbow makers, they will not have a sense of agency on all of this, and they may need, even need to request permission from the gatekeepers uh, to actually address security things. Right? So. That's why I like to, to start with threat modeling on the things they already manage, they already own, right? Because that's where they're gonna have their agency. They don't rely on anyone else to, to potentially make a lot of these changes. Um, and after that, um, we can think about developing and letting them consume uh, baseline tooling for security visibility, policy as code, and then introduce further expert knowledge, such as um, uh, like a proper threat modeling methodology and cre or creation of security scenarios for testing and having them eventually be integral parts of the risk analysis and owning the, their, their own security backlog. Uh, remember that it's the interaction between these and the gatekeepers and how much they trust each other that will ultimately dictate the success of integrating security in DevOps. So this is always going to be a shared journey. Um, but looking at the artifacts is not enough, right? We, we really need to understand their interactions. And this is where, um, uh, for an example of, of using threat modeling, oh, sorry. Uh, this is why I believe, and I've been researching a lot of application of social practice theory, which breakdowns the elements of practices into three. So we've got meanings, uh, which include symbolic meanings, uh, ideas and aspirations, 
we have competences, uh, which encompasses skills, know-how and techniques. And we've got materials, which are the things, technologies, artifacts. And understanding that they are not just interdependent, but actually mutually shaping. So we need to be much more strategic and careful about how we approach each of these elements and how we get them to relate to each other. Right? So one of the, the examples that, um, that, uh, that I usually give is risk registers. Um, again, this is personal opinion. I think the way most risk registers are built um, almost ma make it extremely difficult to be good at managing ri cyber risk in organizations. Because we, what you typically get is kind of a spreadsheet formatted thing where you, you're going to have uh, many different risks that may or may not relate to each other and that you're going to, have, going to be expected to put mitigation plans against each of them. Right. So that's doing, and risk matrices also don't help because we, you then start seeing um, uh, uh, problems and not being able to discern patterns on what should be the biggest priority or not when you address one risk, how it relates to another one. So these artifacts that we've come to know in the, a lot of the gatekeepers to cherish, I think are holding us back, generally speaking, in how well we are approaching practices such as risk management. So this is an example of a uh, threat modeling um, in how we can start by using whiteboarding, right? So make it as easy to consume as possible, right? Um, so um, get a whiteboard uh, and get people introduced to something like Stride and, um, and let's start there. And we can potentially work up to, to having uh, threat models as code. We can potentially work up to having full-fledged methodologies like Plasta, for instance, or Linden for privacy engineering. Um, and in terms of categories, we can start with something like um, um, something like OWASP Top 10, uh, but eventually move to something like CWE or CAPEC that has uh, much more to it. Um, and uh, also appreciate that whenever we introduce a new element, there will be other elements which will mutually shape its form and how efficient or effective it can be. Right? So I think this frame of um, meanings, competences, and um, in materials, I think we in security, we would do well by applying this type of, um, um, of conversation. And uh, a big example is how meanings in meanings, competences, and practices can evolve independent of each other. Right? My favorite example is from uh, Imran, who's also on the call, uh, my business partner, and also um, on how we should evolve the meaning of practices within organizations. Right? And I think this quote is the, the best embodiment of, of this which is, in a DevOps world, the pen test is not for finding security issues, it's to improve process. Right? And I think this quote fully embodies what the, this aspect of evolution of meanings, in that the competences and the materials used to perform pen tests haven't necessarily changed, but its meaning needs to change if we are to going to integrate security and adapt them to our new development practices into our new ways of, of doing things. Um, and lastly, team interactions also evolve, right? So gatekeepers and rainbow makers still live pretty much in significant tension, right? For most, I think what would be beneficial would be a complete reset to square one and start things at the beginning as their current organization structure probably assumes that people can provide service to each other, but it's unlikely that they can do so effectively as it misses the elephant in the room that there are no shared meanings, no effective traceability or efficient communication to build on. Right? And when these three things uh, aren't in place, uh, providing services is likely not going to work because there's going to be a lot missed in translation uh, and a lot that doesn't get translated. So using concepts from Team Topologies uh, book and the three interactions mode, I think is a great place to, uh, to start. So we first need to truly collaborate, and that may even imply it needs to be one team for a while. Right? There, we can agree on governance mapping, management of metadata, and all of those things that I've talked in the, uh, in the last hour or so. Um, and uh, we're going to can expose each of the, of the practices like threat modeling and risk assessments to the whole team. So we ha start having better appreciation of each other's roles, uh, mental models, and how we think of constraints and trade-offs. And this is also likely to require changes to each other's management systems, right? Whether you're using JIRA for, um, for, for both risk management, InfoSec and the development work or, um, or something along those lines, or a completely separate uh, GRC tool um, to enable that. 
um, this effective communication and the informing uh, from one part of the process to the other. Then when we've got these basics in place, we can move to a more facilitation approach where we can start separating some of those practices and establish clear boundaries between the scope of each team and overall have a focus on training. Right, so what do the developers need to train security um, about how what, what, what development is and what security needs to, uh, to train um, development teams on the types of things they should be looking out for or uh, the types of practices they should be uh, adopting. And finally, we may get to a point where all of those that are in place and we can have fully defined interfaces with actual APIs or shared libraries or even what's called team APIs uh, with regards to the services that teams are providing each other, um, where we have informed and supportive roadmaps and mainly managed exceptions, allowing everyone to be effective and communicate effectively uh, without necessarily having to be uh, kind of in each other's faces all the time. Uh, but this is likely to take time, right? And for many, this is probably going to be measured in years. Um, so having realistic expectations is important. So we're uh, approaching the, the final parts of the talk. Um, so should you um, DevSecOps or not? So if we agree that constraints on both archetypes are centered around trust by the gatekeepers and agency by the rainbow makers, then I will argue that it's naive to assume that the organizational practices exist that will create secure systems and promote collaboration around security. So giving it a name whilst we build those organizational practices is going to allow us to discuss them, address them, and also leverage uh, the body of knowledge that exists with the tag name uh, DevSecOps out there um, to have these conversations between the different teams. And I think that's beneficial. But at some point, uh, it may become detrimental to culture and ownership. Right? Um, so in my opinion, is that it may be useful term to introduce uh, so we can start having these meaningful conversations about direction of travel and what each of them need to, uh, will need to do, learn and change in order to integrate security into the DevOps practices up to the point where it beca may become detrimental. So some questions to, to ask to determine if you should use the word DevSecOps in your organization or not, I would say is, do you have tooling um, in place which informs rainbow makers um, of the security states? Do your gatekeepers understand what any controls that you have in place mean for their compliance regimes? Do gatekeepers and rainbow makers set mutually supportive roadmaps or are they selected in isolation? Do rainbow makers have a sense of agency and ownership over the security of their products? Do product owners understand and have a backlog of security work that is validated and agreed by the rainbow maker teams? Right. So if any of those, if the answers to those questions are no, then I think that yes, you should be adopting DevSecOps as something to discuss um, and to create this shared knowledge and these shared meanings. So one should use this label strategically whilst it's providing value and uh, try to develop situational awareness to understand when it may be the right time to move on. Right? I'd argue that until we have traceability, policy as code, team zoning backlogs, and with agency over the shape and form of, the secure, of, uh, of security on their products, it helps and allows us to dip into this body of knowledge that I've mentioned. Because at some point, you do want to be in the position where the name DevOps in your organization is giving you all the security that you need in a sustainable way, and allows both rainbow makers and gatekeepers to dip into the body of knowledge and practices that have been that um, uh, that can uh, increase the likelihood of uh, creating secure products in resilient systems. Mario, so, oh, yep, I have a question with the uh, previous slide. So you have this consultancy experience with many companies. Have you seen many times that uh, some company might be on a journey and they call it DevSecOps? But once they reach the maturity and they have the unicorns, they start calling it back DevOps or does that ever happen? Um, not de depends. Uh, not necessarily on the word used, uh, but um, you start having to refer to DevSecOps as a frame. Right? So you are no longer talking about a, a particular uh, using the word DevSecOps. You're at that point because you have shared meanings. You're talking about um, the outputs of your static code analysis, you're talking about um, what types of, what we need to budget for, for next year, right? So you're not, you're just not using the label, 
right? But you are using the language of the security things that are, they're um, that they're developing or they're addressing. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. So I guess the the labels lose the importance, but the concepts themselves become more correct. So the, the the meanings the the meanings don't change, right? So using DevSecOps or not does not change the security work that needs to be done, right? Whether you decide to adopt it or not, it just changes uh, how um, effective the communications between two different types of teams can, can work if you don't currently have the, um, uh, the shared meanings to deep into the um, uh, security itself and what it means to each of the parties. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, um, and, that, and that's the, the important part, right? So knowing that whether you use it or not does not change the job to be done, uh, which is securing the systems that our, our businesses are producing and the practices that they perform. And as a final note, um, if your strategy mentions the words DevSecOps or security in DevOps, and you are not helping your governance teams benefit from the short feedback loops in training, training them to understand DevOps, not increasing the agency and ownership of security across your product or project teams in their language, not yours, not enabling the best possible developer in the engineering experience that you can afford, and also not actively trying to break down siloed barriers and connect the governance systems, uh, you're probably doing it wrong. And that is me. Hope that was useful. It is. And even though it's the second time I'm, I'm listening to it, I'm still uh, quite engaged and um, I still have questions. <laughs> yeah. Go on. Any other questions? So I haven't checked Slack. Um... I've been uh, monitoring the uh, chat, so there are um, no uh, questions. But someone asked for a URL for the risk register, but... Um, that that was about the joke I was making. Anyway, um, so my question is about leadership. So if your leadership uh, has the gatekeeper mentality, yep. what can you do? So uh, going going back here, right? Uh, I think this is the part that is key, right? Just trying to do everything at once in the. Um, if you've got a, a, a team that is um, a security team that is much of the, the gatekeeping mentality, uh, just saying uh, that um, you need to provide all the agency and ownership to the development teams is not going to work because the trust isn't in place to, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. right? So this is going to have to be iterative. It will need to evolve over time. So that's why I mentioned that I usually like to start with easy examples with policy as code. Right? Because then um, how I approach it is, uh, show me the last uh, 10 pen test reports um, that, uh, that you had in your applications. Then I, I go through those and I identify the opportunities to, um, to, um, to write some policy as code tests that we can give to all of the development teams. Right? And then six months down the line, we can have the conversation, okay, you've had X amount of pen tests in the meantime, you did not see that, um, that thing again, did you? Right? And you didn't because they now have this. And then we start having the conversation and oh, okay, I can understand now because they are getting the, the feedback early on. I'm no longer waiting until the, um, the point where we are 72 hours before going live and trying to, to, to fix problems. But it needs to be iterative. It's finding the pain points in each organization that have hit them in the past that they're not happy with and trying to use that as the, the points where we focus and to, give, to start giving the gatekeepers the, the trust in the process and in the automation. Right? Because they will typically not trust the the, uh, the the automation, nor the teams, and this is how we can start breaking some uh, of those barriers. One of the challenges is that you also need to to think about how to do this asynchronously. Right? So thinking about if you do integrate some of the of these tests, how can you, uh, someone have the the um, um, the owners or the activity of going to to take those uh, the outputs of those tests out of the development process out of the CI/CD pipeline and then put them in a repository or in a, um, a shared folder whatever may be the case so that uh, periodically someone can go to the to the gatekeeper and say look this is what it looks like this is um, uh, the output we've been getting when what the teams have started doing about those. Right. Um, again, how do, how do we start? Because 
if there is a gatekeeping uh, mindset, uh, there potentially there is not enough skilled resources to do code reviews or threat modeling or policy as code. Yep. So that's why thinking in terms of um, not only policy as code, but in terms of minimum security baselines. So things such as the, the secrets management, dependency checking, and all of those, those are the types of things that start building some of that trust, right? It's very challenging, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Changing worldviews um, is always challenging. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? From the audience, I think, uh, I think this is interesting. It reminds me of the uh, the uh, villagers and the um, I forgot the exact terms for it now, but the uh, town planner. Uh, yeah, town planners, and it reminds me of that that kind of conflict and like the degrees between them. Yes, this, I think uh, could be a useful type of map even for other things as well. Yeah, definitely agree. And, and there's going to, in terms of uh, trying to apply these concepts, there, there's always going to, to be a lot of that. Right? So building um, on building some of these basic capabilities. So if we're following team topologies um, uh, approaches, what we would typically do as um, a security experts would be to um, choose uh, or have it made available to you one or two product teams uh, where we can start building some capability uh, for instance, integrating dependency check on the CI/CD pipeline, but um, we could um, work directly with the team um, to to start building that capability. So the way we like to do it in a practical DevSecOps is uh, through leveraging Docker, because um, it's kind of basically copy pasting after you get it to work, kind of copy pasting one line and then working with the team just to make sure they can use the tools. But it makes it simple to actually add the checks, um, and then. Um, after we do that, to push that to a point where they can consume that from the platform, right, from the infrastructure, as something that can be reused across all of the other teams. In doing this iteratively, right, so you would probably try to leverage some security champions, which from a security point of view would typically be more your, uh, your pioneers, people that like to, to explore things um, and see how you can work with them, uh, to eventually trying to push this down to platform where you, you've got a, more of a need to, to standardize how you consume and how you output some of these things. Because when you get to the point where you are wanting to integrate the outputs of these tools uh, to the governance, risk, and compliance, um, to, uh, from a development point of view, to governance, risk, and compliance, then you do need that level of standardization uh, because you need to, to be able to export or integrate systems. And that's going to require more, much more of a, a settler type mentality than, um, than, um, than trying to explore different ways of doing dependency checks, right? Because you've got uh, different tools that you can use. Um, what I usually say is I don't really care about which um, technology people decide to use. I just care that you're doing it. And for the specific um, things like um, a DAST test, independency checking, um, and other types of um, technical stuff, where well, you do have some labs in the coming days. So if you guys haven't registered for them, you can check the Hey Summit website um, for our summit website. Yeah, more questions. Yes, please. My name is Carl. Hello. Um, we are quite a large company. We have, let's say, 15, 20 teams, uh, and we always oscillate between making IT security a large team of its own uh, or like deploying uh, persons into the actual production teams and 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 yes one year we we, we have a large security team and next year uh, we say no security is not an, not a, a department and we rather tend to deploy the, the, the persons into the teams do you have an opinion on that yep so I would refer again uh, back here so the, the way the way to apply team topologies and there's a, going to be a talk uh, next week about this where we're going to have Manuel Paes who was one of the co-authors of the book Team okay. Topologies. So I have the book, yes, thank you. <laughs> I just um, started. I will, I, I, this is how I, I usually approach it. Right? So 
uh, kind of thinking in terms of um, a month or two, working directly with um, some development teams to create capability that you can then potentially push down to platform for, so people can reuse, right? But, but the thing is, it's not just about capability, so it's, it's about the practices as well, right? So having that idea that uh, someone, a security expert can join, um, can uh, be more dynamic in joining a team full time for a period of three to four, uh, sprints where security, where you agree with the product owner that security is going to be given a percentage of effort of the teams. Um, so we can do things like introduce stride, uh, get teams to actually own and develop their own threat models um, and all of that, giving them the tools that they need to do a good job in that space. And then after they can start being self-sufficient and um, understanding how to be sufficient in developing those practices, then you stop having this high collaboration mode because uh, from a cognitive load perspective, uh, it comes at a high cost. Uh, but once people have this basic knowledge that they can start developing their own threat models, then you pull back from supporting that team and you join another team for another two, three months uh, with a few other resources doing the exact same thing and kind of go around the, the, the different teams until they internalize these types of practices that, um, that will build uh, more secure systems. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. And that's also part of the challenge of the, the ratio of security people to, um, to, the, to developers, right? One to a hundred. Yeah. And, that's and the, the point, the yes. Yeah. And just trying to do it generically, creating, let's say, which I see a lot of companies doing, kind of once a month, they do a big threat modeling session for everyone in the company. That's good in terms of getting skills or particular techniques across but it does nothing to, to actually help the teams internalize what it means to them in their context, right? It's when you, we start doing some of these activities in their context, just looking at their product uh, uh, and applying something as simple as stride. So when we have some stride threats um, in your particular application and how we, we can do that until it's internalized, that, um, the, uh, until they develop their mental model of what those things mean in their, the context of the things they develop, it's not going to make it sustainable, right? And it's um, the, the working closely for a period of time so we can then move on that I think is where the, the magic is. So the main main uh, resource is the time, I guess, because as you mentioned during the presentation, there are so many open source tools and free tools that can be leveraged, but it's just the time and building the process around it just is the challenging part. Yeah, but, but, but that's where I think there's a, um, we need, generally speaking, this is obviously, I'm talking to uh, an abstract uh, notion of uh, the security industry, but uh, that's also where we need to, to, to stop dictating tools. And that's a big problem. That's another problem that I'm going to be talking about next week, which is what I call the management problem using worldly mapping, which is um, we still have got a problem that the CISO owns, um, has, too much um, autonomy over uh, security tools in, in organizations. And in tools where uh, particular CapEx oriented um, organizations that have these big capital projects, that leads to, to problems. Because at that point, you've got a, a CISO owning a, a security budget, he's going to make grandiose deals with the uh, check marks and varicodes and all of those, and you're literally going to be um, getting shoving down uh, your development team's throats a particular tool that you are the one choosing. Right? Even if you, and that's the type of model that we need to start moving away from. We need to start getting as security management. We need to get money so that we can uh, then collaborate with two or three different teams as a POC. Let them do them. Um, let them choose the tools that they want to use. Right? And then let's see how we can have two or three different experiments uh, like POCs uh, we did in the past ver uh, in a short period of time and let them have agency over what the tools actually look like. Right? Mm -hmm. And in the model that we're moving to where uh, security in DevOps, they need to have both agency and ownership of security th that is not congruent with massive CISO budgets dictating the tools that teams are using. Yeah, the main problem there is the communication. It's already changing. CISO doesn't communicate with with the engineers, and engineers don't communicate with security. So if there was like a security tribe with both uh, parties in, which I think you explain in this team topologies, 
it would help massively uh, to an extent right so teams that um, that, um, that have a big integration between um, uh, in own security they usually have autonomy in choosing um, the flavor of a lot of things that they use right so for instance, if we are going to um, uh, to get a big budget uh, for security, instead, of w w what I would do, um, what I usually suggest is break that uh, budget down in a way, have some tests with the teams and let them choose their own things. Right? You tell them you need to do static analysis and it needs to be integrated with my GRC thing, okay, if that's what, uh, what you really need to do. And then let's, uh, okay, this is how much money we have, go and spend it. It, uh, because you that way you're not only starting to build trust you're not dictating what security looks like for them because until we keep on dictating what security looks like the other teams won't have agency and ownership yeah um, and, and that's the the what, what the anti-pattern is right we need to start thinking about how we're going to manage budgets manage security programs in a way that retains agency and ownership by uh, by, by the rainbow makers Definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking a lot uh, about that next week as well on uh, one of my talks on worldly mapping. More questions? One question from me, Mayo. Yep. Who should CISO report to? Oh, <laughs> next week as well. <laughs> Where it's more effective, right? Where it's most effective, and then um, it's um, yeah. I, I know this sounds a lot like um, a consultant um, answer uh, as usual, uh, but um, so I think, and this is probably uh, against what many people believe, but uh, in organizations that um, uh, are highly dependent on software. Right. Um, in most organizations these days are software organizations, as we know. I think it helps, um, at least for a period of time, for the CISO to be reporting to the CTO, exactly because of, of trust issues. Right? Because at that point, it becomes it's your boss um, trying to do things, but it also depends on company culture. If, this, if the, the CTO is just going to say, I don't care anything about security and I'm also going to be prioritized, then that doesn't make sense. I think the, the two th key things to, to, to consider are where can we build, um, do we have trust that we can leverage in, um, in, in relationships and uh, is it effective uh, or, or are things moving in the right direction if it's under their uh, director or under their executive. Right? If both of those are in place then I think the CTO, uh, reporting to the CTO is a good place to start knowing that um, eventually, once we've got these practices and all those things, maybe it makes more sense under a COO or a CFO, for instance. I'm starting to believe that every company needs two CISOs, one sitting in the first line, one sitting in the second line. Nah, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> Just opinions. Yeah. Thank you. It's a difference between uh, it needs. It just needs to be effective, right? If if things are, are improving in a way that can be can be measured, then just don't change it. Right? It's a, the, the same thing that um, usually most people um, in a, when they get exposed to worldly mapping, they start thinking about um, uh, PST, right? Uh, Pioneer Settlers and Town Planners. Uh, what we sometimes often forget is what Simon Worley says: you never start there. Until you fix doctrine, until you've got effective collaboration methods internally, don't don't think about changing structure. You fix that first, and then you think about things such as uh, pioneer settlers and town plans. I think Dennis has a comment on there. Very happy. Oh, I've had this argument with him <laughs> many times before. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the interesting thing about you know, where the CISO reports to, right? And I've reported to different types of structures already at the moment. Um, I, I, I think Mario hit it straight away, right? It's, it's where is the most effective. And, um, and I think that the, it also depends on the maturity of the CISO, also the organization, how big it is, right? I think, you know, the, the bigger the CISO team becomes, um, the more it has its own center of gravity. And, and I think the problem is conflict of interest, right? I think one of the problems you see is the fact that you know for example between the CISO and the CPO 
there's a moment where you know you want to challenge some of the decisions made by the CTO, right? And it's a big problem if he happens to be your boss, right? So it, it has a lot of conflict of interest in there, right? Because you know you you want to have a certain degree of independence, and in a way, the CISO is both a facilitator and a security team, right? It's both a facilitator, but also somebody who has to make others accountable, right? You know, fundamentally, when you bring risk to the table, you are making others accountable to those risks, right? And, um, and, and actually, to the other point you guys were making about the, the, the distribution of the teams, right? Um, I, I feel that the job of the security is to make yourself redundant, right? Like, in a way, the best security team is the smallest security team as possible. The only question is, where is the most optimal way to do that? And sometimes you have to centralize to distribute, right? Other times, you know, you, you actually want to delegate it out and just deal and, and just be the, the connector, right, between the multiple elements. Yes. And that's and, and that's where you actually need different personalities, right? So some some organization might need a very technical CISO, other organization might might, might need a very relationship builder, um, you know, non technical at all, uh, CISO, because that's what's required for the organization at that moment in time. Yep. But it's a tough one. I think most organizations would be good to even have a CISO, yeah, right? Sure. <laughs> and actually, the, the biggest problem I see today in society, in, in, our, in our industry, is that today you can still get away with it. So if you give me five companies, you can almost look at the organization of the security team or the CISO, and I can tell you which one takes security seriously or not. But unfortunately, we, we don't measure that, right? Yeah. Which is a problem, right? Because if you have a company that wants to invest in security, they should be rewarded for investing in security. Cool stuff. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. I have shared our Slack invite with everyone. Uh, please do join. And if you have further questions to Mario or any of us, uh, we will be on Slack. Um, it's very live uh, at the moment. Um, and we'll see you there. Thank you, Mario, so much. Thank you.